Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our monthly program. This is a very special one that we have tonight. Um, it is a, a special celebration of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, uh, which allowed for suffrage for women in the United States. This has been a year-long program through the not only the National Archives and Records Administration, but also the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, and many other organizations um, have come together this year to provide educational programming to celebrate the 19th Amendment. But first of all, I really need to thank both Dr. Pam Perry, who is with us tonight, and Pam Sanfilippo. Pam, Pam Sanfilippo uh, has moved from the National Archives and Records Administration to the National Park Service, but both of the Pams worked very, very diligently on this program for months and months. And so Pam, I'd like to thank you personally for your work. Um, but I also need to thank the panel at large because uh, due to the COVID pandemic, we had to we had to move our plans around, and I want to thank everyone for your flexibility and your willingness to work with us to get this uh, program uh, out to the public. Thank you very much. So tonight will be a little bit different than our general program. We're going to have each speaker talk for about 15 to 20 minutes on their specific topic, um, and at the end we will have question and answers. As I mentioned, you can post your question in the chat box and I'll be happy to keep an eye on it. And at the end, we will do a live broadcast uh, question, question and answer. So first, let's begin with Dr. Terry Finneman. Dr. Finneman is going to tell us about the early days of the women's rights movement and the suffrage movement. So Dr. Finneman, please take it away. I am a journalism professor at the University of Kansas and my emphasis is on journalism history. I recently spent the last year as head of the National Journalism Historians Association and I have been studying suffrage for the last three years now. First slide, please. So one of the things that's interesting to think about is a lot of people choose 1848 as the launch of the women's rights movement. And I'm going to be covering 80 years of history in 20 minutes, so this is gonna go really fast. Uh, one of my critiques of the suffrage movement is that it has been really glossed over into this very simplified thing, and it is actually extremely complex. So I'm going to touch upon some of the complexities in as much detail as I can while still going quickly. So really, the, the inklings of the movement can, can really start in 1840, uh, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott attended the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was in London on her honeymoon. So if you can imagine, this woman is choosing for her honeymoon to attend an anti-slavery convention, right? So that's, that's pretty hardcore, good for her, right? Uh, as a young newlywed. So she goes to this convention and uh, she and Lucretia Mott end up forming a friendship based on this because while they're there, um, they're told, well, you know, you're women, so sorry, can't take part, only the men. And they were extremely miffed about this. And this kind of started circulating in their heads as, as time went on. Um, so while they're thinking about these issues with women's rights, one of the things that is a, is a big criticism uh, of the telling of the suffrage movement is how much it has been whitewashed. And really native women since the beginning of time have had very women, in, women dominant societies. And so our founders of you know, the, the white suffrage movement, so to speak, learned a lot from the native women who they were li living nearby at the time. And so you can find a whole story about this in the Washington Post, this is what, what I'm drawing from. Um, but Mott spent a whole month among the Seneca people and observing how their culture worked. And Stanton had frequent contact with Iroquois neighbors. And they saw that women had positions of authority in native culture that white women, could, women couldn't even imagine having in their own. Women, native women were you know, participating in all the major decision-making. They had power to veto acts of war. They played significant roles in selecting the chiefs. And so the white women's suffrage movement was highly influenced by native culture, which is a story that doesn't get told. So 
by having these influences, you get to 1848, which we've all heard about before, um, and Seneca Falls and the Declaration of Sentiments. Now, the Declaration of Sentiments went beyond just the right to vote, and there were actually a list of 18 women-specific demands, because, of course, at this time, women had no rights whatsoever. They were essentially the property of their husbands and could make very no decisions for themselves. They wanted the right to be able to get divorced if they were in bad marriages, to own property, to have of custody rights and the right to vote. So this document was a far ranging women's rights document. So a special note for Kansas here, I uh, have spent the last two years working with the Kansas League of Women Voters, uh, promoting Kansas suffrage history. So a point of pride for Kansas that Kansas is the first state in the nation allowing school suffrage. Kansas was a leader throughout the entire suffrage movement. So since I study journalism history, it's, uh, I think, really interesting to point out that these suffragists started their own newspapers. Of course, newspapers at this time were run by men um, who didn't really take women's rights all that seriously. And so these women suffragists launched their own newspapers, the revolution being a very prominent one. And the goal was to organize and mobilize women for particular campaigns uh, to get these ideas circulating and becoming more mainstream across the country. So the next really pivotal moment, of course, we have the Civil War and the entire focus is on that. After the Civil War, the women's rights movement starts to pick up again and you have the critical time of the 14th and 15th Amendments. So this cartoon is believed to show Victoria Woodhull. I love Victoria Woodhull. She is the first woman to run for president in this country. I put in the chat a link to my book, Press Portrayals of Women Politicians, uh, where I focus on the media coverage that Victoria Woodhull received. She's believed to be the very first woman in our nation to testify before Congress and was really a huge political leader for the time. This, of course, during the 14th, 14th and 15th Amendments, women were arguing that they should be included in them and that women, as well as black men, should get rights and the right to vote. Now, of course, this did not end up happening. They only ended up including black men. And this is where you start to see some fracturing taking place in the suffrage movement and the rise of racism within the suffrage movement as well. At this point, women had been very uh, involved in abolitionist activities. It's how they learned a lot of their political skills. But when women ended up being left out of the 14th and 15th Amendments, you start to see this racism forming of certain white women believing that they should have been ahead of the line of black men. And we'll talk more about racism throughout this lecture. So 1869, it is predominantly states in the West who were the initial leaders in granting the right to vote to women. This makes a lot of sense because these states were forming from the ground up. It is much easier when you are forming a constitution and forming a state from the ground up and don't have any prior roles uh, to be more inclusive, right? So these states were also trying to promote people from the East to come out West. They needed a hook. Women needed to be much more involved in the creation of these communities. And so you see Wyoming and Utah being leaders in the nation, being the first in our country to grant women the right to vote. So I mentioned the fracturing of the suffrage movement that took place. This led to the formation of two different organizations, the National Woman Suffrage Association, which was more radical and had a national focus of a national amendment, and the American Woman Suffrage Association, which was more conservative, focused strictly on women voting rights, and really focused on getting suffrage passed at the state and local level. So 1878, I want you to really think about this because this is just disturbing the more you think about it. So 1878 is when the Women's Suffrage Amendment was first introduced in Congress, okay? We think we have slow Congress today with issues. Yeah, it's been going on for a while, my friends, okay? 41 years, it took 41 years for Congress to act on this amendment, okay? During this whole time, they would have, eh, they'd have their hearing, not really take it too seriously. It took 41 years for this to get through Congress. So, a little bit of Kansas history just tossed in here some more. 1887, Kansas first in the nation to allow city suffrage. Again, a leader in the nation. 
So I mentioned before the whitewashing of the suffrage movement. So usually most everybody has heard of, of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but there were so, so many women involved in this movement and the black suffragists who were involved are often forgotten. And I think we're really fortunate in this past year of celebrating the anniversary um, that their contributions finally, more historians and scholars in the press are going back and giving them the credit that they deserve to have back in their time. So many black women involved in this fight, and they weren't only, of course, fighting uh, sexism, but also the racism that they faced. Um, you have this quote from Mary Church Terrell advocating women's suffrage. She spoke with authority because she represented the only group in this country that has two such huge obstacles to surmount, both sex and race. And of course, you have Ida B. Wells, who was another extremely prominent national woman leader um, who worked with the first African-American woman suffrage organization in 1913. Um, we're going to talk more about this as we go along, uh, but you really see white women trying to keep their movement separate and not allowing black women to take part, which is really a shame. So let's talk about the anti-suffrage movement. This is one of the areas that I specialize in because I want to know what was it about people that got them so riled up that they were against giving women the right to vote. So from 1848 to 1890, uh, you see a lot of the country not really having a formal movement because you know, yeah, people in the West are granting suffrage, but you know, they're just a bunch of hillbillies out there and what they're doing really doesn't matter to us, okay? But as more states start to agree to this, and when you see this map right here, the orange states are the ones that had to be dragged uh, kicking and screaming across the finish line in 1920. Uh, and the other states ended up granting suffrage along the way. So by 1890, suffrage was starting to gain more ground in states and people were starting to get worried. Anti-suffragists were getting worried. So in 1890, you see New York and Massachusetts forming formal anti-suffrage organizations specifically to counter the social movement of women's rights, very much threatened by this kind of progressive movement that was happening. So here's some examples of anti-suffrage propaganda. Of course, one of the main reasons women should not have the right to vote was, you know, religious reasons. Uh, the creator made man and women to govern, but in totally different spheres and methods. There's very much a belief at this time that men and women had different roles in society, that men were in the public sphere and their job was to go out into society. Women were only in the private sphere taking care of their husband, their home, and their children was the only thing that they should do. And both sexes took those roles very seriously. So religion was a very, very strong anti-suffrage argument that played well with the strong religious culture of the time. Uh, here's another one. Uh, women's suffrage will not promote the happiness or physical welfare of women. It will not tend to her social and moral elevation, right? The morality of women was taken so seriously during this time. And if they were getting involved with politics, which was considered to be very, very dirty, it would somehow make you less of a woman. So you notice this of the pamphlet, right? Pamphlets back then were the social media of today, right? They were handing these pamphlets out all over the place. A lot of them filled with a lot of crap, just like social media today, <laughs> So here's some other extreme arguments, and you also see foolish stuff like this on social media today. So this came actually from a letter. Uh, what, will, what will we do if it rains or it snows or the baby is ill or somebody's an invalid? I mean, is the man going to drive to the polls and then the women, they're going to have to go after him and to vote? Like, this is just chaos, right? Like, this cannot be done. Um, you know, then they complain that there weren't enough horses to take everybody to the polls, <laughs> right? So what are you going to do when we don't have enough horses to take both men and women to the polls, right? So, I mean, just the arguments that they were thinking of are just kind of bizarre for us to think about today. Uh, here's another, this would be considered, I think, a social media meme for back in the day, uh, where they would uh, put together these graphic kind of pamphlets uh, and hand them out to people to try to convince them not to pass women's suffrage. All right, so we're gonna jump ahead to 1913. Uh, 1913 was a really pivotal year. So 
suffrage made some good uh, gains from 1869 to 1900, but then they started to stall. So women were going state by state, trying to convince states just to pass suffrage since the National Amendment, right? Stuck in Congress 41 years, going nowhere. Um, Alice Paul was very much influenced by the British social, uh, British, British suffrage movement, um, which was much more rebellious, let's just say, than what was happening in the US. Uh, and Alice Paul was ready to stop being polite and start getting real, right? She wanted to see some action. This was a woman in her 20s. Um, she was getting frustrated with the older suffragists thinking they were taking way too slow and we needed to get on the ball here, right? So she ends up going up against Woodrow Wilson. So again, she was really frustrated that Capitol Hill hearings were going nowhere. The suffrage movement was really stuck in this contradictory mixture of awakening and confusion and figuring out what they should do next. And then, as I said, you have these generational differences at play here with Alice Paul, who's young and in her 20s, and then the older suffragists who said, you know, let's just keep on the track. And she's like, no, this is not working, right? So you have these generational differences at play. You have racism within the movement, right? You have both suffragists and anti-suffragists who were racist um, for, you know, different reasons, but really the same goal. And then you still had arguments at this time about states' rights as well, which of course boiled down to racism again. So 1913, we have the first Women's March on Washington, the greatest of its kind ever witnessed in America is what the uh, press dubbed it. So here is some of the framing they got. Overall, the parade was framed very positively in the press because this was very trivial or very novel. Um, it, you know, they found it fascinating. Um, but here's some of the, the coverage that they got from male reporters at the time. Sore-footed bunch of old hens arrive, right? This is the framing of the suffragists marching on Washington, okay? Um, there was a group of women who marched from New York to Washington, D.C. to go to the parade. This was like February, okay? So imagine that you have hiked 200 miles in February from New York State to Washington, D.C. You're probably pretty tired at this point, right? And yet the newspapers were critiquing, tired as they are, they should have made a special effort to be pleasant to each other, <laughs> right? Uh, they're talking about how young boys were throwing snowballs at these women. They referred to the marchers as a disgusting spectacle for something that was just a fad and how disrespectful that they were to the country. So 1916, this is a critical turning point. A national association opposed to women's suffrage has formed. They're pretty cocky at this point. Suffrage is beaten. They'll never get another state. There were 25 anti-suffrage organizations in different states across the country with 350,000 members at this time. But what they did not count on was how critical of a turning point 1917 was. In 1917, Jeanette Rankin becomes the first woman elected to Congress from Montana. New York breaks the Eastern powerhouse and New York grants women the right to vote. And then of course the US enters the war with women having to go out into the public sphere and help the country and be in the workforce. Therefore, the anti-suffragists are losing a lot of their critical arguments. So again, you have Carrie Chapman Catt and uh, Alice Paul, who are the main leaders of the movement at that time. Carrie Chapman Catt has more of a moderate strategy. Alice Paul has more of a liberal strategy. Both strategies working together are what made 1917 such a critical point. So you'll recognize some of the discourse that you see today being used back in 1917. So the anti-suffragists are pretty desperate at this time. They're getting worried that suffrage is gaining ground and they start arguing for America first, that we are at war right now. These selfish suffragists who want rights, they have no women. They're being selfish, selfish women. Everything should be put into the men and our war effort. So America first was a very strong line during this time. They accused the suffragists of being a menace and that allowing women to the vote would have evil effects on society. This is the kind of coverage that the press was giving at this time. They accused suffragists of being pro-German socialists right, which was a huge insult at this time as well. So they're using fear strategies, and we're seeing these same kind of fear strategies coming out today. 
Here's some other familiar word choices. They called suffragists enemies of the nation. Here I thought me and my fellow journalists were the enemies of the nation. Uh, but back in 1917, suffragists were the enemies of the nation, accused of being extremely disloyal, and that uh, every real American man and woman to this menace of this triple alliance, socialism, suffragism, and pacifism. So here were arguments from the anti-suffragists. It would be way too much time and energy if women voted, and it would cost way too much money. So this is needless economic waste. It would be way too much of a burden for women have to take the time to study. How can they possibly take the time to learn how to vote or anything, right? States' rights, right? States' rights, the underlying racism of why we should not allow suffrage unless we disagree with the state. <laughs> so some of the states did pass suffrage and then they were like, oh, no, no, <laughs> so, right? So they were very contradictory in their own arguments. And they use very vague emotional arguments, right? Just trying to rely on fear instead of any kind of education. So, June 4th, 1919, the anti-suffragists ended up losing. There was just way too much momentum, too many women going out into the workplace, showing they could hold their own in the public sphere, too many states agreeing to it. Women in the West were voting, civilization did not end, right? Um, so you finally, finally see Congress taking action in 1919. It takes a whole over a year for it to be ratified and go around to all the states. Uh, Kansas uh, was the fourth state on June 16th, 1919 to ratify the 19th Amendment. And then this became final on August 18th, 1920 with Tennessee. Now, beyond. So an important point to mention with the 19th Amendment that's come up often in the last year is that the 19th Amendment did not allow all women the right to vote, okay? Because that's not what happened in practice. It took until 1924 before citizenship was granted to Native American women and voter suppression remains on reservations today. It took until 1943 before Chinese immigrants were granted citizenship and the right to vote. And then of course, we all know it was the 1965 Voting Rights Act um, before black women and, and black men, right? Because with, um, uh, with lynching, with poll taxes, with literacy tests, um, there was so much disenfranchisement of, vo of voters up until that point. And really, voter suppression and those kinds of issues continue in different parts of our culture today and are important. All of these things from the past still play out in certain aspects today, and voting rights still very much remain a current issue. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Finneman, thank you so very much. I've, uh, I've jotted down a question of my own. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. So next we have Dr. Suzanne Orr. And Dr. Orr, uh, please tell us about yourself. Uh, Dr. Orr will be telling us a little bit more about the after the, the passage of the 19th Amendment. Hi, thank you. So uh, my name's Suzanne Orr. I'm a professor at uh, Kansas State University. Uh, I'm an assistant professor. I specialize in uh, U.S. women's history as well as immigration history in the early 20th century. And my presentation today is going to combine those two interests. So after women's history uh, became a major field of study in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, historians started dividing um, up women's activism into waves. And Dr. Finneman talked about this first wave, which began in the 1840s and culminated in the passage of the 19th Amendment. Uh, the second wave began with renewed activism in the 1960s. But soon women's historians realized that this division uh, defined activism too narrowly, and it ignored the many ways women continued to participate in politics after suffrage. And so my paper today is going to focus on how women's suffrage activists continue to use the networks that they developed during the suffrage movement uh, to advocate for social change during the 1920s and the 1930s. And so the passage of the 19th Amendment, it uh, 
it reveals uh, divisions among activists about how enfranchised women should use their political rights and how they should relate to the American political system. So activists are divided over whether the government should create special policies to protect women and children, or if women should be treated equally without regard to sex. Um, these issues are especially apparent in debates about the development of labor laws, um, as well as in failed efforts to pass an equal rights amendment. Um, however, today, I'm really going to focus more on how activists influence major political questions about the place of women and children in immigration policy, uh, especially during the post-World War I era. Um, during this period, U.S. immigration policy is becoming more restrictive, and female activists are going to tend to emphasize the importance of keeping immigrant families together. Uh, so part of the reason for that is they're afraid that women and children might end up in the United States alone without a male breadwinner, and that would lead to them becoming dependent on charity. So they argue that women should use their newfound power at the ballot box to stop government raids on immigrant communities, to end uh, mass deportations, and to revise uh, restrictionist immigration policies uh, that separated husbands from wives and parents from their children. Uh, that being said, activists' ideas about who deserved assistance are still really rooted in ideas of race and gender that were popular in the early 20th century. So since the 19th century, uh, women who campaigned for suffrage often believed that uh, women especially had the ability to fix America's problems because unlike men, women could not be corrupted by political power. Uh, that's what they thought. They also argued that women had a special understanding of the needs of other women and children. So by the early 20th century, uh, white middle class women engaged in a variety of different uh, campaigns for reform. Uh, they became factory inspectors, they served on school boards, uh, they demanded safe uh, consumer products like milk for children. Uh, they do things like lobby local officials to uh, clean up city streets and build playgrounds so children would have a wholesome environment. And by focusing on these types of issues like education, consumer protections, uh, women's safety in the workplace, it enables women to carve out an area of political expertise. Um, they connect the issues that uh, affected the home um, to City Hall uh, to justify their demands for suffrage. And uh, white middle class women also become involved in immigration issues. They do things like participate in Americanization campaigns to teach immigrants American values. Uh, one of the most famous examples um, is in 1889, uh, Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr found Hull House in Chicago. It's a social settlement that provides social services to uh, European immigrants um, on Chicago's near west side. And it's modeled after uh, Toynbee Hall, a settlement house in England. And it gives white middle class women an outlet for their education, an outlet for service. Um, and the residents um, of Hull House, and they called themselves residents, the people who worked there, uh, they saw themselves as mediators between immigrants and American society. They helped immigrants, um, in their view, adapt to their new surroundings. Uh, they studied local problems. And uh, they wanted to reframe the debate about the causes of poverty and criminality by focusing on uh, people's environment rather than on uh, individual moral failings. So as part of the progressive movement at the turn of the century, activists like Jane Addams promoted social and political change to enact their vision of the common good. And for them, safeguarding the public meant protecting immigrants from police corruption, dishonest politicians, economic exploitation. And they also wanted to protect European immigrant families um, by promoting normative gender roles and preventing um, exploitation. And suffrage was one of the, the one reform that's going to make all of these other reforms possible. 
So rather than seeing suffrage as the culmination of women's activism, uh, many activists uh, hoped it would really be a new beginning of activism. So as the 19th Amendment's about to be passed, uh, the U.S. is experiencing a moment of chaos, um, social dislocation, as the country is lurching from war to peace. Um, soldiers returning from World War I needed jobs, um, unemployment's increasing, there are race riots during the Red Scare, uh, during the um, Red Summer of 1919. Uh, of course, in 1918 and 1919, there's an influenza pandemic, um, and a two-year depression, a two-year-long depression began in 1920. So this is the environment um, that women are being granted suffrage. And at the same time, the first Red Scare is beginning in the United States. And so it's this moment where after the Russian Revolution, um, Americans start to become concerned that there could be a similar type of radical revolution that happens in the United States and that the US government could be overturned by anarchists or by communists. And the Attorney General, Alexander Mitchell Palmer, is going to conduct mass raids in cities across the United States in November of 1919 and January of 1920. And so during the Palmer raids, uh, the Bureau of Investigation, the forerunner of the F FBI, uh, wanted to arrest immigrant radicals and then have those people deported. So defending these radicals, um, it's something that's really unpopular, but lots of female activists are going to become involved in this cause. And they use the networks that they had created during the suffrage movement to prevent uh, mass deportations. So at a National American Women's Suffrage Association convention uh, held in 1920, uh, Jane Addams and the organization's president, Carrie Chapman Catt, uh, spoke on behalf of arrested immigrants. And in a speech to 300 suffragists, Adams drew comparisons between the government's violation of arrestees' civil liberties and its mistreatment of suffragists. She declared, and this is a quotation from her, the government is proceeding on the theory that because these thinking aliens demand an end of class struggle and equal rights for all, they are plotting to overthrow the United States. So it was said of suffrage years ago. Uh, the Chicago Herald and Examiner concluded its report of the meeting with, and also a quotation, Miss Adams and Mrs. Catt agreed to the solution of the rat, agreed that the solution of the radical problem lies with the women voters and urged their hearers to carry the gospel of free speech to their colleagues in all parts of the country. Um, another opponent of the deportations, uh, Helen Todd, was also a former factory inspector and settlement house worker. She too appeals to suffragists to protect immigrants from the misuse of government power. And she creates an organization called the American Women's Committee um, in New York to lobby the government to keep families together during the deportation process. Uh, she, feared that, she feared that deportation of male breadwinners would lead to dependent women and children experiencing what she called unnecessary suffering. And so the members of this committee included labor activists and suffragists like Mary Field Parton, um, who'd also been a resident at Hull House. And the women, they claimed to be apolitical and they refused to take a position on whether the government had the right to deport immigrants who uh, belonged to radical organizations. Um, they said they were working solely on humanitarian grounds. Uh, but when Todd speaks to audiences to gain support, she announces that women voters are going to change the government's approach, approach to deportation. So in Detroit, uh, Todd promised that, that, quote, political oblivion will be the fate of that small Washington bureaucracy guilty of forcibly separating women and children from husbands and fathers. Uh, Todd would repeat stories to create sympathy for um, what she considered he, her humanitarian work. And according to Todd, American women should, should support the movement regardless of their party uh, to prevent uh, politicians from, uh, from wronging womanhood. So by not supporting dependents along with breadwinners, she declared that America had become uh, the world's dumping ground for destitute women and children. And that's a quotation from her. 
So she wanted to, she saw herself as stopping the government's assault on morality. Um, and American women, she maintained, were going to make stopping, make stopping the government from separating families a major political issue in the 1920 uh, election. So Todd's threat, uh, it doesn't actually materialize, but she and other activists did succeed in getting the government to soften its policies and consider uh, how to keep families together. Um, one of the reasons she's so successful is because the families that she's looking at um, are white European immigrants. Uh, telling their stories is something that gets a lot more public attention um, and sympathy for humanitarian aid. Uh, Non-white immigrants, on the other hand, they were classified as ineligible for citizenship under US law in the early 20th century, and they would receive a lot less help from the white female activists. Uh, Non-white immigrants, um, people who were ineligible for US citizenship, um, their stories get a lot less attention and they receive a lot less consideration from government officials when they're making decisions about, say, deportation. So this, these issues about family separation, they continue to be a major concern for female activists throughout the 1920s. So this moment in 1920 is just the beginning. And uh, after World War I, the United States is creating stricter immigration policies. Um, they implement a quota system and uh, it starts in 1921, there's the Emergency Quota Act that limits admission by uh, European immigrants to 3% of their US population in 1910. It's, their admission is further restricted in 1924 with the Johnson-Reed Act, um, which curtails immigration by lowering the quotas to 2%. And it bases those numbers on the 1890 census before large numbers of Southern and Eastern European immigrants had arrived in the United States. And they use, the people who designed this act, they use the concept of national origin uh, to determine how many immigrants each country could send to the United States. And the United States, um, it grants access to everyone on a first come, first serve basis. Um, there's basically a race to the gate by European immigrants trying to get into the United States. Um, by 1925, the US had received so many requests for passports that quotas uh, for countries would be filled for decades. Um, so uh, the quota for Italy would have been filled for 80 years if everyone who requested a passport received one. The quota for Hungary would have been filled for 127 years. And uh, the 1924 Act, it did allow men who were American citizens to bring their wives and unmarried minor children to the US outside the quota, but um, other immediate family members uh, did not uh, receive those benefits. They were only given some preferential treatment inside of the quota. So female activists, they wanted to humanize, um, as they saw it, the present law to prevent the separation of families. And they're going to lobby politicians to revise laws. And the quota system is going to remain in effect um, until 1965. Uh, but they do use their influence to help in individual cases um, when they see immigrants as particularly worthy of aid. And so despite the appearance of this highly structured system, um, uncertainties in policy uh, give administrators uh, a lot of latitude to make decisions regarding the uh, admission of immigrants. And so uh, or immigrant organizations like the Immigrants Protective League um, are able to help uh, reunite families who, when they consider the immigrants worthy. So uh, that's what's happening through the 1920s. By, the by 1930, um, the Department of Labor, um, it's under the direction of Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, um, and uh, she likes to construe laws broadly and try and find ways to prevent deportations. And as the Secretary of Labor um, under Franklin Roosevelt, Perkins oversees the Women's and Children's Bureaus, um, as well as the Bureau for Immigration and the Bureau for Naturalization. And she has a really strong interest in women's and children's labor issues. 
um, and she brings her experience um, as a sociologist, as a former resident of Hull House to her position. Um, as a student, she's influenced by labor activists like Florence Kelly, um, and she witnessed the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York City that killed 146 workers, um, mostly young Italian and Jewish immigrant women. Uh, but also significantly, Perkins belonged to a new generation of women suffragists who were active in, on college campuses in the early 1900s. And her participation in the campaign for women's suffrage and in other reform movements, um, you know, she takes those networks that she has and she uses them and they influence her concept of reform. And so she's best known for constructing uh, the Social Security Act of 1935. Um, and, uh, but her engagement in creating New Deal programs to aid workers during the Depression um, and her interpretation of immigration policies reflect the same concern of male breadwinners needing to support dependent women and children. And this is also something that's emerging um, you know, out of her experience in labor um, and earlier experiences as a, as a settlement house worker um, and in suffrage. And so she draws on the progressive era legacy um, to prevent the breakup of European immigrant families through deportation um, when she can. So uh, Perkins, uh, she supports increasing the number of German Jewish refugees allowed to enter the country um, when people are trying to flee Nazism. And she tries to manipulate policies to aid refugees um, when she can within the limits of immigration law. So historians who examine Frances Perkins' life and work um, often note the significance of her participation in the suffrage movement to the development of her career. Uh, being the first female cabinet secretary uh, makes Perkins' experience exceptional. But using female networks built in reform movements and using the lessons that she learned in terms of organization um, and uh, in terms of, of values, uh, using those things in politics, that's not unusual for women. Uh, gaining the right to vote was a means for women to champion other causes uh, rather than being a culmination of their activism. So female voters are going to often disagree about politics. Um, they might be apolitical, uh, but lots of women who participated in the suffrage movement are going to continue to engage in reform long after 1920. And in the particular case of immigration, activists promoted reforms to protect white women and children um, to keep families together, just as they had done before the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, they see their work as a moral duty um, as women and as citizens, uh, but at the same time, their vision of the nation's responsibility, um, it does remain limited uh, by their racialized views of who deserves humanitarian aid. So, and thank you, I will stop there. <laughs> Dr. Orr, thank you very much. That was incredible. We got one comment while you were talking actually. Um, so I wanted to remind everybody that we have the chat feature and you can put your questions in there and I'll be monitoring it during the, during the, the um, talks. So now it is time to introduce our last speaker. Um, Dr. Pam Perry is one of our uh, local Eisenhower Presidential Library scholars. She haunts the halls almost as much as I do. Um, Dr. Perry, please introduce yourself and tell us about your talk. Thank you, Don. I'm so happy to be here tonight. And um, I'm not talking about suffrage because I'm going to talk about Eisenhower. But um, what I want to talk about is how Eisenhower advanced women in government. And so we're moving forward a little bit. Um, I am a professor of public relations at Southeast Missouri State University. I've been in higher education for 23 years, and I've spent 10 of those years studying Eisenhower. So I'm a little surprised that after 10 years, I've only produced one book. Um, I have written a book called Eisenhower, the Public Relations President, but I am in the process of writing a second book, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. And I'm going to go very quickly, so you have any interest, the book will be out in about a year, or you can ask some questions in the chat room. The book that I'm currently writing is called um, 
or tentatively called uh, Eisenhower and Women, How um, Changing the Face of Politics. Or my alternative title is simply How Eisenhower Changed the Face of Politics. I haven't settled on one yet. And so one of the things I discovered when I was writing my first book is how much Eisenhower intentionally advanced women in government. And this is something that is not widely known about him. So when historians write books or articles or share on panels like this, they're trying to add to what we call the historiography of the subject. They're trying to correct a wrong, or sometimes they're just trying to shed new light on the subject. And many, many historians have written about Eisenhower's contribution to World War II, aspects of his presidency. And one great biography came out recently called um, The Age of Eisenhower. I highly recommend that book. I thought it was a really good biography. But in digging through the archives at the Eisenhower Presidential Library, what I came across was Eisenhower, among the many other wonderful things he did for the nation, was he saw the potential of what women could do if they had an equal seat within our democracy. And so he set about to appoint women to federal office. When he ran for campaign in 1952, one of the things he said was, show me an able woman and I will see that she gets a job. Now it was important to him that she was an able woman. So implicit in that uh, quotation is that he really didn't want tokenism just to appoint women who weren't qualified just to have women. So he wanted capable women to get real jobs. And he set about, after he became president, and was inaugurated in January of 1953, he gave more women um, federal jobs than any of his 33 predecessors. According to the Republican National Committee and a lot of press kits and things that they put out in the day, so the RNC made the claim that he appointed more women to federal office than any other president. Now, I did read an article in doing my research where they said, yeah, but you know, they criticized the fact that a lot of them were lower level jobs. Um, and I'm still kind of looking into that criticism. But one thing I think is important to note is in the 1950s, women didn't really work outside of the home. So even if they were low level jobs, he was making a difference by appointing women. So I kind of asked myself as I was discovering these little nuggets in the Eisenhower Library, I was doing research on a different book. Why? Why did this man, born October 14th, 1890, which makes him the last American president born in the 19th century, why did he care about women? Um, because a lot of people didn't. Women didn't really uh, break into the workforce during this period. And, you know, uh, early on, he was, seen, he was our oldest president at the time. And so you would think as a man of a product of his age that this might not be that big a thing. So one of the things I want to try to answer in the book is why. Well, there are some early influences on Eisenhower. And um, one of them is his mother. This is a picture of Eisenhower and Ida Stover Eisenhower. And he says in, in a number of different places, and a lot of authors attest that she was the single greatest influence on his life. She was a powerful influence. Now, she was a traditional housewife. She took care of her sons and she ran the household. But she also was a person of, um, she was kind of remarkable, even though she was somebody who, you know, she wasn't mayor or something like that of her town, but there was a, a, a quality about Ida. Um, and one of the things that made her kind of different was she did finish high school. And in her day, women didn't necessarily finish high school. And she went on to go to college. She uh, went to a college in Kansas where she met her future husband and they got married and started a family. But she went to college and she instilled in all of her sons, uh, they did not have daughters, she instilled in all of her children the value of education. She told them that education was a way to a good life. And Ike saw this wonderful example of a homemaker wife, loving mother, loving uh, wife, who also saw that women were smart and women could learn things. And she encouraged all of her sons to go to school. 
Another early influence were the women who worked in his campaign. The 1952 campaign was one of the first times that women came out in an organized faction and really, really worked on a presidential campaign. Many of the high profile women, women who worked in his campaign ended up getting jobs in his administration, which is still something kind of common today. But women came out in droves for Ike and they campaigned because they believed they had in him somebody who valued them, somebody who would see an able woman and give her a job. And so um, they worked for him, they believed in him, they campaigned in him, and that made an impression. Matter of fact, I read in one book um, that 52% of the votes cast for Ike were women. Um, I read one source on that, I haven't verified it, but I also don't have any reason not to believe it. And so women made a big dif difference. So he had a mom who convinced him women were, women were significant and remarkable, and he had these remarkable women working to get him elected. One of the women who worked to get him left, elected was Bertha Adkins, and she's pictured here with him. She worked on his campaign. She was a powerhouse in the Republican Party. And at some point in his administration, he appointed her the undersecretary at health education and welfare. Um, that maybe doesn't sound like an important job, but the undersecretary was just under the secretary. And so it was a high profile job and women weren't normally under secretaries. It doesn't mean secretary as in administrative assistant. It, undersecretary was usually the number two person in charge of a government agency. The health education and welfare was the first cabinet agency created in something like four decades. Another thing that um, really influenced Ike towards women and how they could contribute was how he saw them contribute to the war effort. Uh, the woman in the middle here is Aveta Kolb Hobby, and she was the woman tapped by the government to create the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. Um, during World War II. Um, the WAX, as they became known, um, worked in World War II, and what they did is they provided support services. So they would go to different places and they would fill roles that men had to fill, like maybe clerks. Like if, if you watch MASH, Radar O'Reilly's kind of job, or he's just kind of a clerk. The women would fill in and that would allow um, more men to go and fight. And um, so, she helped create this. She became the first woman in American history to become a colonel. And the wax contributed to the military. At the very beginning of the war, Eisenhower himself as a, uh, kind of admits he's not sure what he thinks about women in the military. He's not so sure. But over time, he sees them perform and he becomes convinced of their value. And uh, he actually wanted women to come to his uh, uh, foreign areas where he was serving so that they could help be a support. In 1946, when the war is over, Eisenhower becomes the Army Chief of Staff. And during this period when the war was over, women were supposed to go back home. This was a temporary thing because the war was on. Um, but in 1948, Eisenhower testified before Congress that he thought it was a good idea for women to become a permanent part of the military. And so he, this tells me at least two things about him. First, he's a person who's adaptable. He took in new information and changed his mind. And boy, wouldn't that be nice to see more of that today from all of us, including me. And he really valued the contributions women made to the war effort. So he had no doubt they could contribute to government. So I've already kind of said this in one of the interest of time, I'm gonna go on, but he's pictured here with Claire Booth Luce, who goes on to be one of his ambassadors. This is a picture of Oveta Kolpabi being sworn in. She went from being the first colonel in American history who was a woman to becoming his cabinet secretary. During the campaign, he vowed to appoint one woman to the cabinet she wasn't the very first, because as we've already heard tonight, FDR appointed Frances Perkins, who was the first cabinet secretary, but Lovetta Kolpabi was the second. Not only that, she became the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and was responsible for the health, education, uh, and welfare of the nation. And a lot of things happened under her watch. 
Um, in the interest of time, if anyone has any interest, um, I will talk more about that in a Q and A. But she um, she did a lot of good things. She wasn't um, Hughes secretary too long because um, around 1955 ish, uh, her husband took quite ill, and she resigned to take care of her husband. Claire Booth Luce was the wife of media mogul Henry Luce, the publisher of Time and Life, and um, she became Eisenhower's ambassador to Italy. And she is considered the first woman appointed to a serious um, ambassadorial post. Uh, I think I just made up a word there. But uh, there were other, another woman at least appointed as an ambassador, but not as big a country, important a country. Catherine G. Howard was the deputy administrator of the Civil Defense Administration. And again, she was a deputy, like a number two role. But again, women in the 1950s, they, they weren't filling those roles before. The Civil Defense Administration was the organization that helped us prepare for war at home. So this was the organization that had us you know, running drills where they had children going down to their desks and preparing for attacks on our nation. And so her job was to help people get prepared for civil defense at home. And she was quite an influential um, person in her own right. And right there she is uh, pictured with Mamie Eisenhower. They were pretty good friends. Anne Williams Wheaton, I'm a little partial to because she is how I found out all this wonderful stuff about Eisenhower. In 1957, Eisenhower appointed Anne Williams Wheaton the first woman to be an associate press secretary to a sitting president. And she has a remarkable story. She's near retirement age when she gets this post. And so she has sort of a remarkable career. Um, but women in the media are unheard of in 1957 certainly in this high profile uh, arena. And the Public Relations Society of America, which is a relatively new organization at the time, noted that the fact she was um, put in this position was really, really significant for women. And Whit Whit Whitman, you could kind of question why I include her. She was Ike's personal secretary. So she fills a traditional role, a woman being a personal secretary is not unusual. Matter of fact, that's the way it normally was. But she did her traditional job in a very untraditional way. She was a remarkable member of his administration, and she did a lot of different things for him. And when uh, Nelson Rockefeller becomes vice president, she becomes his chief of staff. So she becomes the first woman in American history to be the chief of staff for a sitting vice president. So she has a lot of skills she hones during this administration and then moves on to do other things. There are a lot of other women of note that I plan to write about. One of them is um, Ivy, uh, Ivy Priest. She was named the Treasury, the Treasurer. The Treasury Secretary sits on the cabinet and has po uh, policy powers. The Treasurer is a person who signs you know, the money. And so it's more of a symbolic role. But she served in this symbolic role. And if you know anything about Eisenhower, symbolism mattered. And as a matter of public relations, he had a woman fill this role and her money was on all the nation's currency. And so he thought that was a significant um, thing to do. He also appointed a woman head of the Denver Mint and he appointed women judges. He appointed women to uh, the UN Commission on Human Rights and many, many other roles. Um, in addition to appointing women to giving them jobs, finding able women and giving them jobs, Eisenhower was very strong advocate for equal pay for equal work. Isn't it a shame we still haven't achieved it? We've made more progress. Eisenhower was for it. He advocated it. You could even say he championed that. Um, he saw value in equal participation in government. He thought women should participate as fully as men. Um, the other things I've sort of said there, but one of the things I think that people don't necessarily get Eisenhower until they've studied Eisenhower is that he was really a pathfinder in so many ways. He was in the field of media, which is how I began to study him. He has a touch of genius about him in different moments. 
Uh, you know, he's not the most progressive president we've ever had, but he's certainly not the least. And for his time and for his age, being a product of the 19th century, he spent a lot of time advancing women at a time when it wasn't done in other industries. I just also want to give a shout out that uh, I got funding support for my research from the Eisenhower Foundation. I'm very grateful for it. I also want to hear, uh, thank Kevin Bailey, who was my archivist and uh, he, I couldn't have done anything I've done without Kevin Bailey. And then Eastern Kentucky University gave me funding when I worked there previously. And then just my photos are from the Eisenhower Library and Eastern Kentucky University. So you know where I sourced my photos. Thank you. I like to say that the archivists are magicians. Well, I have, um, while we're waiting for other people to perhaps uh, consider their questions or put their questions in the chat box, I have one that I typed on my iPad. So this is for Dr. Finman. Can you tell us about the interaction that the African-American women had on that march uh, on DC? Yeah, so they very much, of course, were there and wanted to participate. Um, a couple couple things to point out. So I mentioned before the women who were marching from New York to Washington. Um, and what was what was bizarre about that uh, is they were marching to a parade for a national amendment, but while they were marching, um, they received questions about, you know, why are why aren't you allowing black women to march with you and they're like well it's a state's rights issue and it's like you are marching for a national amendment you are again you know it, this makes no sense right um but anyway as far as the as far as the parade itself yes i mean this was definitely a quarrel among the the white women suffragists at this time uh about what to do about the black suffragists um and so they ended up resolving well why don't you march towards the back of the parade which was just gross right um but uh some of them refused and they just put their way in uh to the middle of the parade anyway uh which good for them as they should have so yes even the parade underlying had racist elements as well thank you for explaining that to us um dr Orr, there was a comment in the chat while you were talking <laughs> let me scroll back to it um uh, someone writes, the arguments sound similar to some we hear today. Would you like to elaborate on maybe how things are coming around again? Without being political, this is a federal agency. Sure. Um, yeah, a lot of the same debates um, ha are reemerging within immigration policy now. Um, so you can definitely hear some of like the familiarity, um, but both in the language that people use, um, whether it's about um, deportation um, or or families and questions about um, what. Uh, what responsibilities the United States has, if any, to people who who are immigrants, and how should the U.S. Uh, view families and family reunification? So there, there is a lot of um, kind of similarity in the style of language. Um, that being said, uh, you know, U.S. laws um, have evolved a lot over the course um, of the past hundred years, and so that's also something. And that's affecting the debates. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, recommend to people at this moment to um, place some questions in the chat box if you want to. Um, in a moment, I'll get to some other questions that are popping up in the chat box. Um, but as you were talking, I was thinking about this period. Um, and I was curious if there was any sort of connection to the period that you spoke about um and its transformation or did it transform itself into the era at all was there any connection to this radical point of view um and then this era which was considerably later yeah um so there's uh 
you know, there's a desire to, um, you know, in the 1920s um, to have an ERA uh, that ends that ends up just not happening then, and we see this reemergence later on in the 20th century, although it's never successful. Um, and uh, women who supported the ERA um, tended to be more progressive in their ideas. Um, a lot of the arguments about uh, you know, keeping families together, having male breadwinners um, be protected. Uh, the, those arguments, um, sometimes you know, women who are, who are more progressive are making those arguments, but those arguments are also uh, kind of safe arguments based on sympathy and suffering in the family that uh, much more moderate reformers are willing to accept as well. <laughs> Thank you for that. We did have a question from Humanities Kansas. Humanities Kansas is asking, Dr. Finneman, of all the strategies that women used to earn the right to vote, which do you think was the most successful? Mm -hmm. Well, I never can give just one answer because again, I think history is so complex that so many things build on each other. Um, and so, the state's right, or I mean, the, the state by state strategy was very successful at first, right, going state by state in the West, which therefore contributed to more momentum later, which was absolutely critical. The parade was huge. I can give a whole lecture just about the parade itself, um, because I wrote an article about it. Um, but was, what was significant about the, the parade, other than what I talked about, is that the press also emphasized who all attended. Right. So press accounts vary, but anywhere, at least 5000 people were expected to have taken part in this parade or been around there, which was during the inauguration week, uh, weekend of Woodrow Wilson. Right. So women back then were protesting a president as well. This is not new. Um, what was unique about that parade is that the press emphasized that there were teachers and farmers wives and librarians who were taking part of this. So this wasn't just like the fringe element, right? You know, a liberal fringe taking part, but this was everyday people. And I think the parade was a big wake up call for the nation that, you know, maybe this is something that a lot of women care about. But one of the things that I did not talk about, which if you want one, I, I, I suppose I'll give this one, uh, was the Night of Terror, which, which also happened in 1917. So women started picketing the White House. This was Alice Paul's group. Uh, they started getting more aggressive, like the British suffragettes. So suffragettes is more of a British term. We use suffragists typically here. Um, so they started picketing the White House. And these women started being arrested and thrown in a very nasty prison. My friend Candy Carter Olson has done significant work on this topic. Um, and so the stories start to come out of these women in prison being beaten, being force fed, um, being injured, and the nation was shocked that this kind of thing was happening. And so the Night of Terror was also a very pivotal moment that I hadn't discussed yet. Thank you. Here's another question. Was the fear of communism the reason that women were kind of forced by societal pressures to return back to being housewives after the end of World War II? Specifically, the Soviet Union supported women and people of color in the workforce and that America did not want to be like them. I'm not sure I can answer that really authoritatively. I think that when the war was over, um, the notion was that things would go back to normal, that you know men would take their jobs and women would go back to the homes and that um, if women didn't go back home, then men wouldn't get their jobs perhaps. And so I don't know if it was really a comparison with other countries. I would have to study that more. But I do think that the notion was still that um, I read a book by David Halberstam, one of my favorite journalists turned historians. And he wrote about a book on the 1950s. And basically, one of the things that he said was that, you know, women just were not taken as seriously in jobs. Uh, at that time that uh, gender was almost considered more than talent. And so men were considered seriously and women weren't. And um, so I, I'm not saying that the um, idea of the question is wrong. I'm just saying I can't address it, but I do think that there are multiple factors. And one of which is just, we needed to return to normal, I think. Thank you. 
The next question in the chat box is, what are the current immigration laws regarding numbers of people allowed into the country and when can they become a citizen? I've heard of people who wait 20 years to become a citizen. Yeah, so uh, current laws are quite complex. So the quota system that I was talking about um, from the 1920s, um, that was repealed um, by 1965 um, with a law that uh, very much changed the way um, people immigrated to the United States and, uh, and who was allowed to immigrate to the United States. Um, I don't know the like exact numbers um, that you know of people that are allowed to come to the United States uh, currently, um, but uh, people can wait, you know, as, as you mentioned, years in in order to become become a citizen. Thank you. We have a comment that perhaps one of you would like to um, expand upon. Uh, the comment is, the anti-suffragist movement was pretty much the same as the anti-ERA movement. Would anyone like to expand upon that? I mean, I, I guess I would just say in general that you you still, I mean, through across social movements, uh, counter counter movements um, are, are, are still prevalent across any kind of social movement today, right? So I, I've done a bit of studying of, of counter movements and generally, in general, um, and, and they're, they tend to be more united in what they're against than what they are for. And so just in general, they tend to have way more of a negative emotional kind of rhetoric. Um, and, and so that's just how they are formed. And, so, and, I, and I think we still see that in a lot of areas today. Thank you. Um, that is the end of the questions that we have in the chat box. So I would like to offer people to turn to, to open up their microphones and ask questions. It's a little difficult in this uh, venue because we can't really rely on each other's body language to know who's going to speak next. Um, so with a little grace and a little um, patience, we can do this. Does anyone have a question that they would like to pose? Can I add something, Don? Absolutely. And just tag teaming off of my last response, I have my notes in here from Dr. David Halberstam, and I think his quote uh, addresses the question. In his book, The 1950s, David Halberstam argued that cultural attitudes in America had not changed regarding married women working in post-war America. Um, in fact, women who worked were seen as less feminine um, they were often on the slow track to nowhere. Again, this is his words. Um, and gender, not talent, was the most important qualification. Men were taken seriously. Women were doomed to serve, serve as support troops. And so in this particular book, he's talking about American attitude. And what year was that? Like to, for me to mentally put it into context, what year was he referring to? The 19, it's a, a book on the decade of the 50s. In the 50s. We're talking about the 1950s, which is Eisenhower, Eisenhower's decade as president. So he, basically, I think even if other countries had the same attitude, we had them, that they were all our own attitudes as well. Okay. Well, I can only see a handful of you on my screen. Um, would anybody like to ask a question? Well, while everyone is trying to not be shy, Dr. Perry, I'd like to see if you could um, tell us a little bit more about Ida Stovall, um, uh, uh, Eisenhower. I'm sorry, I'm stuttering really badly. I apologize. Um, so she had a particular background. What led her to be sort of progressive? You know, I, I think it was sort of her personality a little bit. I, you know, um, Sometimes when you read and study about somebody for 10 years, you think you know them. So obviously I don't know Ida, but she struck me as the kind of woman who was just sort of a tour de force in her personality. And then one of the things that formed her was she was a deeply, deeply religious woman. And her faith really formed a lot of her being. I think it gave her a lot of confidence. But like, why shouldn't she go to college? And why shouldn't she learn? And why shouldn't she encourage her sons? Because 
I think her faith gave her that confidence that uh, she was created by God for a certain purpose. And so I think her faith had a lot to do with it. Um, and, you know, beyond that, I, I, I haven't studied her as much as I've studied her famous son. So we have a handful of staff on, on the, on the call. So perhaps somebody can correct me, but we have a quote of her saying that she wore sweaters before females were supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. It is an interesting, um, juxtaposition that she was a pacifist. And when Eisenhower went to West Point, um, she reportedly cried tears uh, that mm. he was off uh, to West Point to become, you know, a soldier. Um, but I, as far as you can tell, and in the readings, it didn't cause a rift between them. She just was a pacifist. And I think that's part of why you see in this dichotomy in Ike that he was a man of war who sought peace. And so I think that Ida tempered that part of him, that he was a general who, you know, warned us about the military industrial complex. And I think that comes from his relationship to his mom in part. Thank you. So I am keeping an eye on everyone's little icon to see if anybody unmutes themselves. And we don't have anyone that's unmuted. So, would anyone like to offer any last comments just to give those of us who are a little bit um, hesitant to speak in public a moment? I, I have a question. Um, what is it about the, uh, the American uh, attitude towards women? I, there's so many other countries where women have been able to, you know, become leaders, like presidents. That, um, what is it about the American background or ethos that makes it so that it's so difficult for women? I, I mean, in the 50s, they were not taken seriously. Um, and it's taking many years for for women to be recognized that's an excellent question is somebody interested in taking it dr or your microphone is uh, activated so i wanted to see if you wanted to talk <laughs> um let's see um uh, my microphone was activated by admit i did not have a specific answer to that question <laughs> Which, which is a which is a big and important one. Dr. I mean, Perry, go ahead, go ahead, Terry, and then I'll jump in. Certainly, part of it is our position in the world, right? I mean, the United States is such a superpower, which therefore makes us a little different situation, right? Where this would literally, literally be the leader of the free world. Um, and so that separates us a little bit. And other countries uh, have different forms of government, of course, where um, their structure of government means their their leader, of course, has a has a different set of power um, as opposed to ours. So some of those factors come into play, um, as well as just I mean, from the founding of of this country of being founded on on religious principles, right? I mean, that's why people came over here. It, it, it's, escaping religious persecution being able to strongly celebrate celebrate and practice the religion, which. The Bible, of course, is founded on strict gender roles, right? And so that has just been ingrained into the founding of our country um, and, and has continued to persist until today. Another thing that we, I think, not know, I know that we struggle with is not only issues with men, because one thing I didn't mention earlier, those anti-suffrage organizations, they were, they were women. They were led by women. Um, and we continue to see sexism from women against women, right? We have seen that in the last few presidential elections. Uh, we're seeing sexism in, in the coverage of Kamala Harris that's happening now. Um, and so we have a long way to go with women's treatment of other women in this country, let alone of, you know, with men. You know, I, I agree with a lot of what you just said, and uh, well, I don't disagree with any of it, but... <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and um, I did recently watch uh, the miniseries Mrs. America about the fight for the Equal Rights Amendment, 
and how it was women who kept women for fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment. And so I do think that there, there's a history of that, that um, not all women perceive power equally. It's just like, you know, there's not a single black vote. There's not a single woman vote. And so I think it's just a very complex question. It is, it is. But I'm glad you made us think about it, Sylvia. Yes. Okay, got a chat pop up. Uh, I think the Calvinism in the founding of the United States mm -hmm. is more strict in gender roles than the Bible itself. The United States is founded on the Puritan mindset. The Puritan mindset is not biblical. Yes, yes, those Puritans were hardcore. We've been discussing them in my history class. <laughs> they were hardcore, yes. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm glad you made us think about that tonight. All right, would anyone else like to pose a question? No one seems to be unmuting. Can I? Um, yes, you may. I'd like to make just a, a little point if I could, and it's it's more about Eisenhower than it is suffrage. But today I was talking to a, a reporter, a really good reporter from the local paper, and one of the things that he asked me, because they're um, dedicating the memorial to Ike on Thursday in Washington, D.C., and he said, you know, during this particular time where we have, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and people are tearing down monuments, is it a good time to be putting up a monument to a white guy? And I thought, you know, a provocative question. And I said, well, if we can't put up a monument to this white guy, I don't know who we would put up a monument to. And so one of the things that I, I said in my response was, equality for women and equality for minorities doesn't mean erasing white men. It means making room for the rest of us. And they're allowed, you know, we want them to stay too. And so as uh, this monument to this great world leader is dedicated, um, you know, I just find that it's about time, it's way past time, and that uh, hopefully we can continue to celebrate uh, white guys along with women and minorities. And um, if you want to watch the dedication, it's live streamed. <laughs> Okay. That's true. So the, the Eisenhower Memorial's website, eisenhowermemorial.gov, um, on, their, on their landing page has all the information about the, this week's um, activities. And they are going to live stream the dedication ceremony, which is Thursday night, uh, through their Facebook page, and the link's right there. Uh, so thanks for reminding us about that, Dr. Perry. Um, it would be a great um, way for everyone to interact with the, the dedication ceremony. Thank you. All right, uh, Samantha, you want to put the our closing um, uh, slides back up? Uh, so this was a part of the National Archives uh, celebration of the the centennial of the Nineteenth Amendment, the ratification of the Nineteenth Amendment. Um, and at the Eisenhower Presidential Library, we are participating through um, various ways with 19 and 52 uh, Ike Women in Equality. And what we wanted to do at the Eisenhower Presidential Library is show how Eisenhower supported the women's rights movement and women specifically through his administration. Uh, this program was brought to you through funding with the National Archives Foundation. We're very thankful that the National Archives Foundation uh, got behind all of our all of our um, centennial celebration activities, and a big shout out to them. Thank you for that. Um, if you want to learn more, we have some websites. The National Archives has a website, uh, specifically or a web page, specifically um, uh, connected to the women's movement. Uh, the website is on the slide in front of you, um, and the National Archives Foundation as well. We have put up uh, an online exhibit. Um, which is incredibly and serendipitously a lot like Dr. Perry's program tonight. Um, and it is uh, on our website, uh, eisenhowerlibrary.gov, on the exhibits page. Once we reopen to the public, we are planning to have a full uh, in-gallery exhibit uh, along the same lines as well. So I hope that you can come back and visit us when we have this available. 
And all of our programs, our public programs this year are made possible through the Eisenhower Foundation and the Union Pacific Foundation. And I am very, very grateful for all that the Eisenhower Foundation does for the Eisenhower Presidential Library. And our next program, in case you are interested and you wanna jot it down, our Lunch and Learn is always the fourth Thursday at noon. So it'll be Thursday, September 24th. And we will have James Worthen talking to us about his new book, George Humphrey, Charles Wilson, and Eisenhower's War on Spending. I'm really interested in that. Um, and then our next book talk will be Thursday, November 10th at 7 p.m. to Helen Back. Uh, we'll be discussing to Helen Back. And all of this information can be found at our website, eisenhowerlibrary.gov. Um, Dr. Perry, Dr. Orr, Dr. Friedman, thank you so very much for your time. Um, I'm, I was looking forward to this night for so long. Thank you for your flexibility and thank you for your talent and your skills.